Uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to give the opening act of the final day of this year's Drinks Conference. It's been a, uh, a really wonderful and stimulating conference, so I really want to thank the organizers for putting all this together and for uh, inviting me to give a talk here. I'm going to be talking about a uh, paper that I wrote with Aaron Wall uh, that appeared earlier this month, where the general subject of concern uh, was black hole thermodynamics, and in particular, black hole entropy and the second law of black hole thermodynamics. Now, I know it's early and it's been a long week, so I'm going to start with something that we can hopefully all agree about without um, thinking too hard. So I'd say we probably don't need to justify to this audience the statement that black holes have entropy. Uh, we have uh, some understanding of uh, why this is true or how it works in certain cases of stationary black holes, although we don't really have a complete understanding of this for the general black hole, which is dynamically evolving. Now, as we learned in Hong's talk earlier this week, entropy increases as we evolve forward in time. Hopefully, some of us knew it before that. And we don't expect that black hole entropy should really be any different. So we expect that the entropy of a collapsing black hole, a dynamically evolving black hole, a growing black hole, a feeding black hole, many different names out there, we expect that this grows as we evolve forward in time. But as I said before, we don't really understand the way that uh, black hole entropy works for dynamical black holes. But we can use our intuitions about the way things work in the stationary case to at least see which questions we should be asking or uh, have some, some intuition about what we should be seeing. And so some of those very natural questions are whether the entropy of a growing black hole is a measure of our ignorance of what's behind the event horizon, and whether this entropy is proportional to the area of the event horizon. Now, ultimately, questions about black hole thermodynamics are really questions about quantum gravity. And so, really, we should be using things that we know about quantum gravity to answer this question. And of course, the most powerful tool in our arsenal, or at least one of the most powerful tools in our arsenal, is holography. And of course, holography was uh, originally motivated by black hole thermodynamics, although in this talk, I won't be using the general holographic principle, but rather the very particular and precise example of ADS-CFT. Now, I'm going to use really one particular instance, in a particular example of um, an entry into holographic dictionary in ADS-CFT, which is the holographic entanglement entropy prescription. So this is the RT or HRT, that we're using the covariant formulation. So this is the statement that the, and we saw this early in Tadashi's talk, this is the statement that the uh, von Neumann entropy of a density matrix on the boundary is given by the area of a surface X over four in Planck units in the bulk. Now generally this is stated actually for um, a density matrix either of the full boundary or a boundary subregion, so you can do a reduced density matrix. But because I'm going to be considering black holes today, which are compact objects uh, in the bulk, I'm actually only going to be considering states and density matrices of uh, a full boundary. So here is Schwarzschild ADS, and I'll be considering density matrices of um, one side, so one full boundary here. Now the surface X is a co-dimension two space-like surface which is homologous to the boundary and is an extremum of the area functional. So if you slightly perturb the surface, the area doesn't change to first order. And finally, if we have multiple such surfaces, then we take the minimal area one. So in this example here, the bifurcation surface X here, this is the HRT surface whose area gives us the entanglement entropy on the boundary. So the area of the event horizon is the von Neumann entropy of the boundary. And this sounds very nice, and we might, uh, might hope that the story extends beyond this uh, ADS Schwarzschild case, and that perhaps the von Neumann entropy on the boundary is uh, telling us something important about the black hole in more general setting. But this turns out to be a problematic perspective. So we can prepare a, uh, a black hole from collapse and it, is, it can be dual to a pure state on the boundary. So, of course, the von Neumann entropy of a pure state vanishes, and correspondingly, the minimal area surface in the bulk has vanishing area. It is the empty set. So, of course, the von Neumann entropy is uh, conserved under unitary time evolution, so this is actually zero for all time. 
But if this is dual, this state is dual to an evolving black hole, a collapsing black hole, well, the entropy of this black hole should be growing. So clearly, the von Neumann entropy is not the correct quantity to think about as the boundary dual to the black hole entropy. OK, so uh, why is this the case? Well, it's the, the problem is that, as we found out in Hong's talk, the von Neumann entropy is never going to give us a second law. It's too fine-grained. We really need a coarse graining if we want to obtain something that increases as we evolve forward in time. And one very popular way of doing this in ADS-CFT is to restrict your attention to a boundary subregion. So we take the reduced density matrix of a boundary subregion, which is effectively a coarse graining over its complement. But this doesn't capture what we want to see here. Because here we are looking at the black hole. What we want to do is not a coarse graining over a boundary subregion, but rather a coarse graining over a bulk subregion. Intuitively, we want to coarse grain over the interior of the black hole. We want to fix the exterior and coarse grain over all possible black hole interior geometries. And so this, this thing we, knew, we do um, in ADS-CFT, in the usual case where we restrict rho to a boundary subregion, isn't really capturing that. So what can we define as a coarse grain quantity that will do this for us? And one natural way to do this is this object we defined as the outer entropy because it is associated to the outside of the black hole. So this is a maximization of the von Neumann entropy over a class of density matrices. And these density matrices rho prime are dual in the bulk to a classical Einstein geometry. So we're working in the large n, large lambda limit where the black hole exterior is fixed. What this means effectively is that we're considering all possible geometries that we could stick behind inside the black hole while not changing what happens outside of the black hole. So the black hole exterior is fixed and we're sort of sticking all possible geometries that we can, can in the interior while still satisfying the constraint equations and any other constraints imposed by fixing the exterior. Now this would be a perfectly precise definition if I only told you what I mean by fixing the black hole exterior and in particular, if I told you what I mean by the black hole exterior. How do we qualify the exterior of the black hole? And some of you in the audience may be thinking, well, that's obvious. You should just use the event horizon to tell you what's inside and what's outside. And unfortunately, this is one of those situations where the more you think about it, the more confused you get. So for those members in the audience who are not yet confused, allow me to confuse you. So the event horizon, even though it's a natural notion, of uh, the boundary of a black hole, and it, it has an area law, which we like to think of in thermodynamic uh, quantities as a thermodynamic interpretation, it suffers from uh, what's known as the teleology problem. It's the very definition of the event horizon, which is the boundary of the past of asymptotic infinity. What this means is that you need to have access to the entire future history of the space-time if you are to determine the location or any properties of the event horizon at any moment in time. Effectively, what it means is that if we want if, to associate uh, an entropy to the area of the black hole, and we want to determine the entropy of the black hole now, then we need to know if in 10 million years some star is going to fall into it. And for a thermodynamic quantity, that's a very uncomfortable A causality. So there's been, there's been a lot of work on trying to find more locally defined alternatives, uh, locally in time, I mean, to the event horizon. These normally use gravitational lensing and talk about the way in which light rays bend due to gravitational curvature. The first one was actually the apparent horizon, which was defined by Hawking, and that's the one that I'm going to use today. So let me briefly go through a, a little detour on defining that the apparent horizon is, and then I'll go back to talking about this coarse-grained entropy once I have a precise definition of what I mean by the black hole interior and the black hole exterior. So, Back to the apparent horizon. So let me take some co-dimension two surface mu here. This is a space-like co-dimension two surface. And I can fire light rays either into the surface, so that's this uh, L over here, or I can fire them outside of the surface, the outgoing light rays, this is this K here. And I can do this at every point on the surface mu, which generates for me this, uh, these two congruences, these two null surfaces. So there's this orange one, which is generated by the ingoing light rays, and the purple one, which is generated by the outgoing light rays. 
And as I've drawn it, the cross-sectional area of the orange one decreases as we fold forward in time. Here, time runs upwards. And the cross-sectional area of the purple one increases as we evolve forwards in time. However, this is very much based on a flat space intuition. If you look uh, deep inside a black hole, near black hole singularity, uh, big crunch singularity, if you fire these ingoing light rays, they still converge. But what happens is you fire these outgoing light rays, and they actually converge as well. And so you get this local in time definition of light not being able to escape. You fire it outwards, but it actually ends up going in nonetheless. And so if we want to think about surfaces like that, which are called trapped, as what's inside the black hole, and these normal surfaces where uh, like the air cross-sectional area increases as the surfaces we see in an asymptotic, an asymptotic region where things are approximately flat, then it makes sense to think of the boundary between the two as the last surface on a time slice where the light rays are neither converging nor expanding. In other words, the last surface, as I wrote here, where light rays do not bend into the exterior. In other words, in other, other words, the area is stationary. And so this is precisely the definition of the apparent horizon. It's this last surface on the time slice where the light rays do not bend outwards and the area is stationary. Let me give you an example. So here's a collapsing black hole. This is just a, a 3D rendering of the same picture. So I have this collapsing star here, and this is the event horizon. This is in gray here, um, the surface out here. And the blue here is a co-dimension one surface which is foliated by apparent horizons. Remember, the apparent horizon is a co-dimension two surface. So every time slice of this blue surface here is an apparent horizon, and it lives inside the event horizon, at least in classical Einstein gravity. And r equals zero here, this is just the singularity. Now, one very nice thing about the event horizon that I mentioned earlier is that it obeys an area law. And we don't really want to give that up. We really like area laws. So fortunately, we actually don't have to if we are looking at the apparent horizon. So a d minus one dimensional surface, which is foliated by apparent horizons, just like this one is here, um, obeys an area law under a certain set of assumptions. So here is my uh, d minus one dimensional surface, which is foliated by apparent horizons. That's these purple slices over here. This vector k here, this is the outgoing uh, light rays. And the area increases monotonically as we evolve along this object from the interior towards the exterior. This was actually first discovered in 1993 under a, a certain set of assumptions, and it's been rather mysterious since then. What is the interpretation of this? Because even though we like to associate to area increase a thermodynamic interpretation, it's somewhat unclear what this interpretation should be because this surface is space-like. And so what I'm going to do in, uh, in a few minutes once I talk about this coarse grained entropy a bit more, is actually give an explanation for, excuse me, for this, uh, this space-like area law as a th in terms of thermodynamic quantities. And one last thing which we should check is that this agrees with our intuitions in cases where we do understand what's going on. And actually, in the static black hole, the event horizon is precisely foliated by apparent horizon, this, this degenerate situation where the apparent, horizon actually, where apparent horizons actually live on the event horizon. So all of our intuitions about the static case do apply to apparent horizons. OK, so let me know that I've defined the outside of the black hole, the inside of the black hole, and the boundary of the black hole, go back to the coarse grained entropy, which is, of course, the subject of this talk. So here is a picture. Here is my apparent horizon. And I'm going to call this object here, the outer wedge of the apparent horizon, the exterior region. This is the region between the apparent horizon and the asymptotic boundary. And what we would like to determine is what is the entropy associated with coarse graining over its interior. So that's this wedge here, which is the region between the apparent horizon and r equals zero. So we've defined before this coarse grain entropy, but it wasn't quite a definition because I didn't say what the exterior was. But now we know the exterior, what we mean by that is this outer wedge region. That's the thing we want to fix. So here is the precise definition of the outer entropy. So this is the outer entropy of the apparent horizon. Again, this is a maximization of the von Neumann entropy on the boundary over all states rho prime, such that rho prime is dual to a, to a bulk which is a classical Einstein gravity and 
it has the same outer wedge, but possibly a different interior over here. So this is, it's clearly an entropy we can associate to the apparent horizon. It measures our ignorance of its interior. What is this object? What, uh, do we know, is there anything useful about this thing? How do we compute it? And rather than giving you the full proof and derivation of what we did, I'm just going to give you the punchline. So here we have the outer entropy. This is just a definition again. Now the HRT proposal tells us that this object is simply the area of the HRT surface in the bulk dual to rho prime over four GH bar, again fixing the outer wedge. And what we did is we actually proved that this quantity here is precisely the area of the apparent horizon over four in Planck units. And I find this to be very surprising and, and remarkable that it's true that the outer entropy, just entropy of ignorance behind some surface just happens to be equal to the area of that surface over four. And I think that it's is probably telling us something fundamental about black hole thermodynamics. Now, the proof is very involved, so unfortunately, I don't really have time to go into it. But I do want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of how this proof works. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you what the maximizing uh, density matrix is here, which is what is a rho prime that actually saturates this. After all, you might wonder whether a maximum is even achieved. And of course, this rho prime is not going to be unique because you can just act on it with some unitary and have the same uh, von Neumann entropy. So what is the maximizing state rho prime? And we constructed one explicitly. So let me uh, explain this picture a bit. Here is the outer wedge, the apparent horizon. We don't touch these, these are fixed. And well, this is, and the state rho prime, by the way, this is dual to one side of the boundary. So we actually constructed a two-sided geometry. This is the sort of the coarse grain geometry corresponding to our finer grained uh, one-sided black hole. Now this surface here, N, is a null surface where with the area is stationary along the surface. So any slice of the surface, any space-like slice, has the same area. This means that mu and x have the same area. X here is the HRT surface. And then to complete this construction, we use CPT conjugation to generate the rest of the space-time. So we know by the HRT pr proposal that the entanglement entropy of rho prime, which is again on this boundary here, is the area of x over 4 GH bar. And we know, because n is a stationary surface, that the area of x is the area of the apparent horizon. And together, these of course tell us that the von Neumann entropy of this one side is the area of the apparent horizon over 4 GH bar. And so this is the space-time that realizes the maximum, and so we can think of it as a coarse graining of our original space-time. Again, so long as we don't include this uh, other side here, which it ends up giving us a pure state altogether. I promised I would explain the area law, this uh, sp weird space-like area law that we've known about since uh, 1993. So how does that work? Well, let me take some uh, co-dimension one surface here, which is foliated by apparent horizons. So these are, I've just picked three of them, one, two, and three. And I've shown their outer wedges here. This is a dark gray, dark gray extends from here all the way to the boundary, and then the lighter gray from here to the boundary, and the white from here to the boundary. And these are associated with boundary times, T1, T2, and T3. This is just the boundary of the past of this wedge here. So why does the area increase? And I claim that we actually, if we had known about the outer entropy before, we could have predicted this area law. So here, if we're looking at the outer entropy of this first apparent horizon, we're coarse greening this region subject to these constraints. So we're maximizing the von Neumann entropy subject to a very large set of constraints, which is all the data in this large wedge here. As we progress along this uh, co-dimension one surface, we are looking at nested wedges, which means that we're maximizing a quantity subject to progressively fewer constraints. And what that means, of course, is that the quantity must grow. And so we know that the outer entropy must increase as we evolve along this surface. And since the outer entropy is proportional to the area, the area must increase as we evolve along this surface. This also translates into a non-trivial second law on the boundary. The outer entropy at T1 increases to T2 and again increases as we evolve forward to T3. So this gives an explanation of this uh, bizarre area law that we didn't really know what to make of uh, at the time that it was first found. Now, the natural question here that comes up is what is the boundary dual? 
of this outer entropy. At this point, it's defined as a hybrid. It's a maximization of the von Neumann entropy subject to fixing a bulk region. We can define it purely as a bulk quantity by saying that it's the maximization of the HRT surface area subject to uh, fixing the outer wedge. But it would be nice to have a purely boundary interpretation. So how would that work? Well, we would want the dual to be a maximization of the von Neumann entropy subject to fixing the field theory data which is dual to the outer wedge. And your first question might be, well, what is the field theory dual to the outer wedge? What's the field theory data dual to the outer wedge? And that's actually the wrong first question to ask. The first question you should be asking is, how do we even pick a single apparent horizon from the boundary? After all, this picture makes it clear that you have many different apparent horizons in the bulk, and you really want to be able to pick a unique one from the boundary in order to even talk about the dual to the outer entropy. And so this, this turns out to be a very nice uh, explicit procedure for doing this. So let's pick a time slice on the boundary here. And we can fire these ingoing null geodesics into the bulk from this time slice. This doesn't have to be a nice time slice. It can be something jagged as long as it's achronal. We can generate a surface, N sub L. This is a null surface. And we can look at the, go at the outgoing null geodesics, these K ones, the ones that were purple before, at every slice of this uh, null surface. And eventually, you can prove that we will find a surface at which these one, the, the, state, the area is stationary as we evolve in this outgoing direction. And in fact, furthermore, you can prove that this outermost one is compact and unique. And this, of course, gives us also an outer wedge. So there is a nice procedure for, from a time slice on the boundary, picking out an apparent horizon in the bulk. And there are some assumptions associated with this that, unfortunately, I uh, don't have time to get into. So now we're back to the question of uh, what is the field theory data which you need to fix in order to fix the outer wedge. Now, unfortunately, we don't have an answer in broad generality. But uh, what we can show is that when the apparent horizon is perturbatively close to the event horizon, so this can happen if you uh, let the black hole evolve for a very long amount of time, so you're very close to equilibrium, then the dual to the outer entropy can be obtained by fixing the one-point functions of operators subject to turning on sources after time ti, where we assume that everything propagates locally in the bulk. So we're not taking anything that's too co complicated. O is not allowed to be anything that's too complicated um, in order for this to work. Now, this, um, this, this, is, this is good if we understand things perturbatively, but of course it would be nice to see if something like this holds uh, when the apparent horizon is very far from the event horizon, so um, sort of an, uh, if we're like over here, for example. And we don't really know if that's, uh, if, if, if this works, it must, if it must be modified in some way. So let me, uh, okay, let me, uh, let me summarize. So we showed that the area of the apparent horizon is the entropy associated to our ignorance of the region behind it. Now we can construct explicitly at least uh, a coarse grain space-time which uh, corresponds to the maximizing state of, uh, of the von Neumann entropy, subject to fixing the exterior of the apparent horizon. Again, this is not unique. At least uh, we, know, we know for a fact it's not unique. There may be many states that are not uh, related to one another via unitary transformations, which also maximize the von Neumann entropy. Now, I want to say also this is actually the first holographic explanation of one of these black hole area laws. We still have the Hawking area theorem that tells us that the area of the event horizon increases as we fall forward in time, but we actually still don't have an explanation for that. So if anyone is looking for a difficult problem to tackle, that, that certainly is one outstanding one. And again, we proposed a possible boundary dual by fixing the one-point functions with sources, but it's not, uh, it's not really clear how general uh, that is. I want to say a few words about some future directions and some applications. So everything I've talked about so far has been for compact surfaces. Because what we cared about was the black hole. So we cared about things inside the black hole. We cared about compact surfaces. But you might ask how much of this is going to generalize to boundary anchored surfaces. Now the issue with boundary anchored surfaces is that, well, when you anchor them to the boundary, the area is divergent. We know when we have extremal surfaces that these divergences are local to the subregion and we can deal with them. But it's not clear what, what's going to happen with these surfaces which are not extremal. And, and my understanding is that there will be some, a paper that will uh, come out 
explaining some of this uh, divergent structure in the near future. Now, however, when these apparent horizons are extremal surfaces, which actually does happen, extremal surfaces that are anchored to the boundary can be uh, apparent horizons by some modification of the definition, it would seem that much of our construction does go through and that we don't have to worry about the divergent structure, in which case we have an interpretation of the area of these non-minimal area extremal surfaces. And this, there already exists one interpretation, which is entwinement, and this is a, a very different one, which we obtained by coarse graining over a large set of states of von Neumann entropy. And uh, it would be interesting to see if these are related in some way, or if this is just simply a completely different way of thinking about these non-minimal area extremal surfaces. Now, I was a little bit coy about the area law, because I gave you this, uh, this nice space-like area law, sort of this region over here for a collapsing black hole. But it turns out that, uh, in general, the apparent horizon um, or these, sur these surfaces with stationary area have um, actually, they, they, you can find them, you know, in time-like components deep inside the black hole. And so if you have a collapsing black hole, what ends up happening generically is that you'll have regions of, you have, you have surfaces which are time-like and foliated by these surfaces, and then it could be space-like and then time-like again, and then space-like asymptoting to null. And actually, a couple of years ago, uh, Raphael Busso and I proved that the area monotonically increases along these no matter how many transitions they go through. But unfortunately, a current explanation of the area, of the area law cannot accommodate these uh, signature changes. So it would be interesting to see if there exists a modification of our work that can, uh, ac that can accommodate these signature changes. Finally, and perhaps most interesting, are one of our end corrections. How much can we say about uh, quantum corrections? This construction was purely classical, and we used the Einstein equation. But it, some things are clear on how to generalize to uh, include semi-classical corrections. But of course, it's really not obvious how we can relax our use of the Einstein equation to accommodate these quantum corrections here. So um, that would be interesting in a possible future direction. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. So in your derivation, you use HRT formula for von Neumann entropy of a given bulk region. Mm -hmm. So if I understand it correctly, the bulk region in question include region near the singularity where the gravitational field is strong. Uh, is this so, sorry, so, so, so the bulk region? <laughs> so if I understand it correctly, the bulk region in question for the apparent horizon include the regions uh, near the singularity of the black hole where the gravitational field is strong. So uh, is this something I should worry about, or is this something you can explain away? But is, is what something I can explain? Sorry, <laughs> there's, some, there's some, a little bit of feedback with this. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should speak up. So, <laughs> the, so you use HRT formula for, for, Neumann, for Neumann entropy yeah. for the bar, given bulk region. Yes. And uh, the bulk region in question include a uh, region near the singularity of a black hole where yeah. the gravitational field is strong. Yes. So is this something I should worry about, or is this something you can explain away? Um, well, you, you, no, you shouldn't worry about it. Uh, of course, if we were dealing with quantum corrections, you would be very right to worry about it. But uh, since this construction is purely classical, um, this, uh, this, this is strictly large, and this, we, don't, we don't have any issues with this near singularity region. Does this answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> well, if I have to worry about quantum correction, then even if it is suppressed by 1 over n, the uh, 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 co coefficient in front of 1 over n can be pretty large. Is mm -hmm. that what you're suggesting? So it should I be worried about it? If, if what, sorry? <laughs> Excuse me, maybe I'm so not There's just a little about. bit of feedback with this, that's all. Okay, so, uh, so you're saying that the qu if you, uh, you should, this is something I should worry about when I consider quantum correction to your formula. Yes. But that means that if you do 1 over n correction, yes. coefficient of 1 over n would be very large. And again, it is something I should worry about. So um, if you have 1 over n, cor I, I don't really, we don't have anything to say about 1 over n corrections at this point. And um, I would say, yes, you should be worrying about this if, if we start talking about 1 over n corrections, yes. So in a case like that, I would say that 1 over n correction would be significant. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry. Maybe I'm not speaking well. Yeah, without the microphone is better for me. What was the question? Um, yeah, you, I mean, you can. We're, this is strictly a, uh, 
this is it's not a physical limit. It's sort of a, we, we wanted to get an understanding in this particular, you know, at infinite n, and then we would hope that we have a way of modifying it for one of our incorrections. But because we haven't thought those details through yet, I unfortunately don't have an answer for you at this point. Yeah. Other questions? Also? So uh, is your conjecture for the CFD construction of the subject? <laughs> so, sorry, what was that? It what? <laughs> if you can repeat the question after the test. Um, okay. Is your or if you can just speak into the microphone, is that, would that work? <laughs> yes. So is, is your conjecture for the CFD construction of these objects equivalent to requiring that all the endpoint functions of operators uh, that are dual to gravity fields w for any finite number of them is, is the same in the future? Uh, it is, sorry, let me, let me go back to the slide on the field theory dual. So, in, in this, sorry, what was, the, what was the question about? Yeah, so asking asking whether this definition is yeah. equivalent to asking that all the endpoint functions with a finite number of operators for the operators that are dual to gravity fields remain fixed? Um, so it's not clear if a finite number of operators is, um, is strict enough, actually. Uh, small number of local operators, probably. Yeah, it's, uh, this, this, I think maybe the issue with this quotation marks around the word simple. We, we need things that propagate locally in the bulk. Um, so that's, um, I guess that's the weakness of this definition here, yeah. One more question. One thing I worry about in the classical regime is that apparent horizons are defined in a foliation dependent manner. And yeah. there's a well-known construction due to Iron and Wald which shows that for stationary black holes, you can find foliations where there are no trapped surfaces. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is there a preferred foliation that comes from the boundary, or is this something to worry about with vis-a-vis -vis this construction? So um, maybe let me find the picture here. Sorry, there it is. Okay. So uh, yeah, so the apparent horizon is foliation dependent. And for, for any foliation with apparent horizons, we can certainly make this work. And this particular construction, actually, sorry, was the last slide. Um, this construction guarantees for us the existence of an apparent horizon associated with a particular boundary time slice. So while there certainly are foliations that do not have apparent horizons, there's a sense in which our construction doesn't really care about that. Because if you have an apparent horizon, we can give you the interpretation of the outer entropy of that apparent horizon in terms of the area. And if you don't have an apparent horizon given your foliation, well, we don't really care about that because there's no apparent horizon. And of course, from the boundary perspective, there always exists a foliation that's going to give you these apparent horizons, modulo the uh, caveat that if you actually have a, a black hole and, uh, and a white hole singularity, then you may have a situation where this doesn't have any causal contact with the boundary, like in, um, in a long wormhole. And then, uh, then this prescription actually does not work. Okay, I think we should move on. So let's thank our speaker again.